if your project works at this point, you've got a very basic content of an HTML document. It doesn't look that nice yet, but the purpose of CSS is to do that. So um, we're going to start to write a little bit of CSS code here. Uh, you, if, if you kind of learn more about this stuff, uh, you'll see that you, um, you write the different languages and they have their own syntax and their own tags and their own code and such. But once you kind of learn a little bit about the syntax of one, it makes sense throughout it all. And the syntax just means the way you write it. The way we write HTML, the syntax is that it's almost always some sort of tag, some sort of content, and then an ending tag. Or there might be a tag, an attribute, content, and then a tag. The special case is our image. There's a tag, attributes, but no extra content. And the content is sort of in the attribute. That's the basic syntax. Tag, uh, tags, attributes, content. CSS, the syntax is going to be a little bit different. So let's back up to where we had our head block. We had uh, title into slash title. After title, but before end of head, let's create a script tag right there. Oh, sorry, not script, uh, style. We've got this style tag. The purpose of the style tag is we will write CSS code here. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. It's just the code that we need to know to style, to change the design of our project. Inside of the, um, the style block, inside of this like little world right here is CSS code. Now we write comments like this. So this is its own like little world of code. Actually, let me zoom in. There we go. And the uh, the comments now are not this. This is an HTML comment. This is a CSS comment. We do slash asterisk, no space in between, asterisk slash, and stuff, and then asterisk slash, no space in between the asterisk and slash. If you do put a space between there, it might kind of turn the wrong color that it's wrong. There's no space. And it's the same sort of thing with HTML. I can put it in multiple lines for multiple comments. So we can say over here, everything in this block is about styling our HTML code. So anything between those, uh, those comment tags are the um, the comment code that gets ignored. And the big idea with any of this CSS code is to either define or redefine existing code. So CSS defines or redefines existing code. So if I were to write outside of the comment block. I'm still inside of style, but I'm outside of the comment. Now this is real CSS code. I'm about to say, wherever a body tag exists, let's change it like this, such as background color. And this is the part when these code editors are really nice, because as you start typing, you may get hints. Do you mean background image? Do you mean background color? Do you mean background attachment? And now, if you want, you can use the, the pop-up here to help you. You can double-click it. I mean background color. And then I can do a color like red. And then this pops up. Do you mean red, Indian red, pale violet red, dark red? Dark red, sure. And then semicolon. So this kind of code looks very different than HTML. This syntax is very different than HTML. And, um, and this is the way you write it. Now, I just suddenly realized something. Is it a little bit easier for you if I turn down the lights? 
let's check on that. Does that look a little bit better? I usually, yeah. I usually do turn off the lights. I don't know why I forgot to. I was so eager to start coding. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I'm having trouble now, like I'm commenting on my comments in the style section. Okay, let's check that. So this is where we're at so far. Let's, let's try to save it and run it, and let's see what happens. Well, I'm on the white browser. No, that's fine. So, uh, style is <laughs> so the um, this code here, this CSS code, is basically saying wherever you have the body tag, let's redefine the default. The default is a white background, but we're going to say background dash color red, and it should become a nice bright red color if you run it. There, it was way too bright. But we have a bunch of other colors. We could do blue, we could do gold, they all pop up right there. Goldenrod, light, goldenrod, yellow. There's all of these there's all of these built-in colors. Okay, quick tip for everyone, this door will always be locked over here for safety. You want to enter from the other one. So now with some CSS code, we can start to redefine things. We can uh, change the default colors. Uh, so um, this is an existing thing that then we can change it over here. Well, we can pro we're probably going to change a bunch of different things. So it would be better to enter to move these things to their own line, you know, each sort of command um, in its own line. Question? I can't see the background code. Okay, let's check that out right now. Let's see if we can get the Um, we've got these rules, these CSS rules, sometimes called selectors. We're selecting something, and then we've got these uh, properties and values. So we can say CSS has um, selectors which affect properties with values. That's like the very technical way to talk about this. There is a selector. This is selecting any tag called body. Its property of background color has a value of goldenrod, in my case. We have these other things that we can do. Let's say, next line here, next property, font-size, colon, let's say 200%. So we're saying any fonts that are in the body, now their size will be 200 times, 200% 200 the normal size. If you save it and run it, you should see now your text is huge, 200% bigger than the default. So obviously we have the ability from, you know, 0.1%, I guess 0.01% to, I don't know, 5,000%. So you can have one letter as big as the whole screen. So CSS, this book is 500 pages long, and half of it, and half of it is HTML, and the other half is CSS. There's this other book that I'll mention next week about JavaScript, and that one is 600 pages, and it's only JavaScript. So basically, HTML is easy, CSS 
is a little less easy, and JavaScript is hard because JavaScript can do a lot. It's very powerful and interactive. But in one book, you can cover both HTML and CSS, but you need a whole separate book for JavaScript. And CSS is similar to HTML in terms of um, there's 200 codes. You don't need to know them all. You just need to know the ones to do what you need to do. So just for fun to look at this, this is going to be way too big, 200%. Uh, I'm going to set it just to 110%, you know, slightly larger than the default size so that it's a little bit more readable. Font dash family. Now, when you get these tooltip pop-ups, what you can do is using the arrow keys, you can go up and down and then you press enter to keep the one you want and it types it for you. And then here we can type fonts, the names of fonts. So uh, like courier gives you sort of like a typewritten font. And um, we have one called Onyx. Looks like that. Well, sometimes when you pick a certain font, you also have to change the size because now that's getting a little hard to read. Uh, but you have this ability to edit and affect all of these things. We had a little while ago before the break a completely basic website. The content is still the same. The HTML did its job. Now we're doing the CSS's job, the design of it. And we can put in a bunch of fun fonts here, and this is just an example. And it looks really scary, perfect for Halloween. Right there. <laughs> now on that one I had to increase the size up to 200% because it was hard to read. So uh, I'm going to keep it really simple here. Um, I have a bunch of fonts to choose from. I'm going to keep it simple with Arial. Just a simple, readable font. OK, well, our CSS is currently saying anything that's inside the body tag affect it in the following way. Our main design, we've got body, and we've got all this stuff. Well, we eventually then also started to work with see if I can get it all on one screen. We started to make this div. There it is. We, we made this generic container div, and we have more stuff inside of it. Well, I want to write some CSS. I want to write a CSS select to select this div so that I can affect the stuff inside of it. Here is where we then take into account the ID attached to the div. So, okay, to make the notes up here, we'll say tag selector targets a plain HTML tag. That's what that did. It found any instance of that tag and it, up, and it affected it. Next we'll say ID selector targets a tag with a certain ID. We have uh, down at the bottom of the screen here div ID equals page. The way to select that is div pound or hash mark page, then curly braces. So what we're saying here in this selector, go find a tag with, an, with a name of div, and it has an ID of page. So in the HTML world, ID is the word ID. But in the CSS world, ID is the pound sign, the little hash mark, the, the number symbol. And what I'll do here is say with um, 
50% background color uh, aquamarine, let's say. So on, on the previous CSS, I said behind everything, make it gold. But then inside of this div, make it aquamarine. And make this box only 50% as big as the screen. So let's see what that looks like. That should look like something like this. So there's a box. Now ignore this sort of like edge over here. That's something else. Oh, there it goes. But uh, here it is. So when I resize my, my browser, the, the container, um, the, 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 the generic div container with an ID of navigation um, is, uh, there it is, is only 50% big. So if my screen is this wide, 50% is halfway. And behind it is a background color aquamarine. So again, the idea is that there's all of these invisible boxes, you know, boxes inside of boxes, perhaps, and we can affect all of those boxes. Now, I'm going to... Question? Need a little help there? So the, um, the book example uh, creates this interesting sort of border design as part of this page. So I'm going to change this up just a little bit. Uh, instead of width, uh, we're going to use something called max width. So the maximum width of our, doc of our, of our design will stretch out to 940 pixels. So a pixel is a dot on the screen. Instead of using these percentages, which will vary, uh, we're going to say make this the maximum that this box can grow will be to 940. And we also have min width, as in minimum width. And on that, we will do 720 pixels. No space between the number and the unit. You have to have the number and the unit together, 720 pixels. Like when I had percentage, I had 110%, no space in between. So this box can grow and shrink to a minimum of 720 and expand to a maximum of 940. So it's within a certain boundaries. Background color here, again, picking whichever one you want. There's one called, um, I don't know, pale turquoise, whatever. Uh, besides that, we have something of margin. So in, in this textbook, for example, if I go to a regular page here, there's a part of the design that's empty right here and on the bottom and on the top. These are the margins. Our content never goes past a certain margin. We can define what these margins are on all four sides of the page. So that's what margin will do. It'll let us target all four 
sides of the box. So, for example, if we have 55 pixels, space, 25 pixels, space, um, 10 pixels, space, and 75 pixels, space, this is defining the four sides of this container in clockwise order, starting from the top. So this first unit here is saying, at the top of the screen, push things down 55 pixels. On the right side of the screen, push it over 25 pixels. At the bottom, push it up 10. And from the left, push it over 75. So we can define all four sides of the, uh, of the margins. We can say here, <coughs> the four sides of the box starting at top going clockwise going clockwise Now I think then that might make my design look a little weird. It might look like off-center, it might look a little weird. That's fine, I'm just showing you that. You can define all four sides of the margin of the page. What I actually want, uh, according to the book, is a way to center the design a little bit more on the screen. And the book has a suggestion of instead of those values, we're doing 10 pixels auto, 10 pixels auto. So clockwise from the top. At the top, give me 10 pixels of space. At the right side, an automatic amount. At the bottom, 10 pixels. And at the left, automatic. Because if you've got you know, a sheet of paper like this, and you want an equal amount of space here, one inch, one inch, on a vertical sheet of paper, um, that's enough space. When you go landscape, okay, now I'm going to need three inches to put it centered. So if I had programmed it that it's only three inches, it wouldn't look good on both of those dimensions. With auto, it will automatically figure out the exact amount of space on the left and the right, whether you're a tall monitor or a landscape monitor. So at the top and bottom, it's 10 pixels. But left and right is an automatic amount right there. So it should center your, uh, your design. The four sides of the box. OK, then we got padding. 25px. Margin is outside the box. Padding is inside the box. OK, by that we mean, technically, when I was showing you the piece of paper, I was actually talking about padding. Inside of the page, I want one inch margins all the way around. Inside of the page, one inch margins. Padding. Outside of the page, that's where the margin is at. How far is it from my hand? So margin right here, it's 10 pixels. Right here, it's 25 pixels, 50 pixels. So margin is outside of the, of the box, and padding is inside. So we're saying, Give us some space outside of the color. Give us some space inside of the color. So for example, when I run that, it changes. And lastly here, border. Four pixel solid black. So 
So now this makes sense. In this box, in this div, we will give it a border, thickness of four, style of solid, color of black. And right there we can change all of that. Thicker border, thinner border, just change that pixel value. If you want it red or purple or yellow, I change that color. As for the possibilities of the style, that one you kind of do have to look it up. Actually, does it pop up to kind of give advice here? Solid? No. You kind of do have to know them or look them up. There's one called double, for example. And what that does is it makes a double line around it. What if I want that red? So it's red. Uh, what is there? Oh, there's also dotted. So it's got little dotted lines That's around it. Yeah, it looks like the little light bulbs in a, in a movie theater. Like something like that. So there's dotted, there's dashed, there's a bunch of these that you can look up, but just to look at something interesting, Four pixel dashed red, and you have a dashed line around the box. So that's a little bit of design there. I next want to target this logo so that it's centered. Based on what we've learned so far, we could, in theory, know what to type. Because logically, wherever I had the body tag, do the following. Wherever I have that div for page, do the following. I want to target this image in this div. How do you think we might write our code to target that image inside of that div? Div hashtag logo. Yep. Div hashtag logo. So that's the logic there. There's some sort of tag with some sort of attribute. The tag is div. The attribute is ID logo. So now what we can start writing in there is CSS code that will affect that image. For example, width 150 pixels, margin 10 auto, 25 auto. So eventually, when I put an image into my folder, now the image is centered. There's an automatic amount to the left and to the right, 10 pixels from the top, 25 below it, so that this text is not right next to it. And our image will eventually go right there, uh, centered at the top. I want to start to style or affect those bullet points. So again, based on what we've already done, we should be able to take one step outside the box to see what we need to do next. I want to start to edit these bullets. So how do you think I start writing my CSS selector? What's that? I don't see any div. I don't see any div that is that is that has this stuff. No, it's the UL. Okay, so it's the UL. Yeah. We have a UL tag that is affecting the, the line items. Yes. So why do we do div hashtag whatever the ID is? I've been learning just you know doing the hashtag and whatever the ID is. I never did the whole div hashtag. Is there like does it do something differently or? No, if you just do pound hashtag, a pound page like that, that works just fine. I, when I teach this, I teach it like in the most detailed way uh, because both are doing the same thing. Obviously, an ID is attached to something, and an ID can only be on one thing. So it'd be perfectly fine just to do pound page. But just to kind of get the idea, because when, then when we get to other more complex things, we're going to see, well, this 
ID or class is attached to this tag, so it doesn't hurt to write the tag and what the class or ID is just to kind of get the idea. And then we can do the shortcut later on of just the class or the ID. So we were on the right track here. There's an unordered list somewhere, and it has a pound navigation ID. And now we're going to affect. We're going to affect it in this way with a 570 pixels, a padding so that the edges, so that the edges don't touch up against each other too much. 15 pixels margin so that we can center it zero auto zero auto we had border which on all four sides of the box I added a dashed line but we have border top bottom left right etc so I'm going to say border dash top so only on the top of the navigation, I want to add a two pixel solid black line. At the bottom, border dash bottom, also I'll do five pixel solid black. text dash align center so if we step back for a moment again the this is something that's on page 325 the book does a very good job of showing you little by little there's one page that explains completely what does the p tag do what does it mean there's one page that explains completely the image tag there's one page that explains completely the ul tag Every tag that we've worked with so far is explained pretty much completely on one page. 300 pages later, we have enough knowledge to start to make a basic website. So for this class, again, the first two weeks, the first two class sessions, the first two assignments are going to be focused on this HTML code. And then we'll get back into the more familiar WordPress. But knowing the knowledge of this code will also help us in WordPress. And whatever I talk about here, we can still talk a lot about it and learn even more nuance, but I think we'll learn enough to do some interesting things early on. I'm starting to put this together, that now this is starting to get centered. I've got these lines dividing over here. I want to get rid of these bullet points in a moment. I want to line things up nicely. That's the whole point of the CSS. Okay, this one's a little trickier. I want to target list items inside of an unordered list with a certain ID. So it would start off similar. There's an unordered list somewhere with an ID of navigation, but then space li. So I'll make a note here. A selects a an a ul with a certain id attribute next over here we've got selects a list item inside of an unordered list with an attribute with a certain attribute and I, I I think you should think about maybe reading it from right to left sometimes like this we can start from here there is a list item space inside of something with an ID that is a that is an unordered list or from the left to right. Go find an unordered list with a certain ID and then inside of it, space a child of or a descendant of technical term, a list item inside of that unordered list, do the following. 
That's what that's trying. That's what that is trying to say. We can get very specific. Um, it can get very complicated. Again, HTML easy, CSS not as easy, JavaScript hard, because something like this, where now you have to think about how is the page constructed in order for us to affect the things we're trying to affect. And the great thing about programming is there's so many ways to do things. The bad thing about programming is there's so many ways to do things. <laughs> because there could be something that you accomplish in two lines of code or seven lines of code. They're both correct. They both do what you need it to do. Maybe one is more readable, one is more verbose, one is more compact, one is more you know, harder to read, but it does the job. They're all right. All the code is right, all the code is wrong. As long as it does what you need it to do, it's a little subjective about how, how it's done. But here what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to target all instances of list items in a certain unordered list, in a certain little group of unordered lists. What I'm trying to do specifically is to say, display inline, and that is to take away the bullet points. So the default behavior, we just saw a moment ago, the default behavior of list items is to have bullet points. Well, CSS lets us add to or rewrite or change HTML. And so we've said we don't need those bullet points anymore. We want it all in line, all in one line. Bullet points default are on their own block, in their own spot. But with display in line, we put them on their own spot. I mean, all in one line. And now they're too close together. So we can add a little bit more. We can add margin. We'll do here, uh, we'll do five pixels. So now all the way around, there's a little bit more space between, actually I want a little bit more, maybe 15. This is a great thing here that you can, you can experiment with it. Um, I might start off with a certain size, and as I look at it, I need a little bit more space. The book said three, which I think is way too short of a space. So I put 15. Now there's some space between each item. Okay, so my design is looking a little bit more like this. There will be an image. I've got this cool nav bar at the top. If I try to click something, it won't work just because they, those things don't exist yet. Um, then we've got a spot where an image will appear and then where these paragraph, where this text will appear. Well, this image is in a paragraph and then this welcome text is in a paragraph. I want both of these things to be centered. So I, know I want to write some CSS to target both of these. And previously, we have targeted things with based on their IDs. These don't have IDs. Any guess about what CSS selector I might write to select both of those paragraphs? P. P all by itself. Those paragraphs don't have any extra um, identifiers. They're simply paragraphs. They're P's in the document. And so um, we're saying anywhere that there is a P tag, do the following. Text align dash center. I mean, text dash align center. So any text inside these paragraphs, center them. Make the width of both of these 600 pixels. Give me some margin space of 20 on the top, auto on the right, 20 at the bottom, auto on the left. So 
we've got an invisible paragraph over here and inside of it an image. But we're saying now center the stuff in that paragraph so the image will center. So we've got some text. So it centers. And then there's also some invisible amount of space behind the scenes. This nav bar can be further edited a little bit. Um, okay, so the book has it in a certain order, but I'll change it just a little bit. Let's say before this paragraph, I want to affect the links in the nav bar. Each of these is, is a clickable link, which is inside of a, the nav bar. So if I look at my HTML code, I've got a link that is home, and the link is defined with the A tag, which is inside of the list item, which is inside of the unordered list. So it's going to start off similar in terms of there's an unordered list with a certain ID space. Inside of that is a list item. Inside of that is an A tag. So basically, the, the spaces are very important in this case because you can think about it as inside. An A tag inside of a list item inside of an unordered list. And there are shortcuts here that we can do as well. The book actually has a different shortcut. Again, all, all the code is right, all the code is wrong. But this right here is one way to do it. And I'm doing it very explicitly, very specifically, that this if you've never seen CSS, the way I'm doing it here is like very explicit. This is what's happening. There's an A tag inside of a list item inside of an unordered list with a certain ID. The shortcut, in our case possibly, is simply the A tag and delete everything else because we're saying go find anything with an A tag and do the following. And in our case, our very simple project, it would work. But if we had a much more complex project with divs inside of divs and columns and all that stuff, maybe that's when we need to be more specific. But what I want to do here is set the color of the text to black. Background color purple. No, that's going to clash in a weird way. Let's do color white. White on purple, sure. And padding five pixels. So uh, I'm making these. The, the background color was too close to the text, so I added a little bit of padding five pixels. Well, when I was doing it previously, when I had the four values, a shortcut here is if I write it one time, it will apply it to all four sides. If I write it four times, I'm saying, okay, five at the top, ten at the right, one at the bottom, and fifteen at the left. You don't have to write this, but just to show you, now it kind of gets all jumbled up. But um, now I have this different amount of spacing and such, so I think just one value is fine. That line underneath things, well, that's something in the uh, that's something in the design that can also be affected, and we have a property for that, which is text decoration. None. Remove the underlines. So the default behavior of an A tag is to put an underline on your links. I can change default behavior if I know what property to affect and what value to set. This is the big idea, this is the big purpose of CSS. 
What is the selector? What is the thing I'm trying to affect? What is its specific property? And what is the specific value? There are defaults. The text is automatically to the left. I said, no, put it in the center. Automatic text decoration is underline. I'm saying, no, put it on none. Automatic corners of these boxes is a perfectly straight corner. I can say border dash radius and then some amount. And I have these little round corners instead of the default square. I have these cool little like pill-shaped buttons. And maybe I need more padding, maybe 10. This is the part about being creative. Links are a special case because they have states. There is the state before you click it. There is the state when you put your mouse over it, when you hover over it. There is the state at the moment that you click it, but before you let go of the mouse. There's a state of after you've clicked it. You've been to a website most likely where you've got a bunch of links. You click on a link and next time you come back to the website, the link color is different because you have already clicked on that link it's now in the it's in the state that it's been already clicked and oftentimes you hover over a link and it changes somehow while well, you've gone to the state of, of hover so we can affect all of those also through CSS and uh, the way I'm going to do this is a little copy and paste sometimes it helps to copy and paste because I want to do something similar to that it won't be too bad to retype it but I'm going to save my effort by copying that line because I also want to target an A tag inside of a list item inside of a blah blah blah. So I'm going to copy that, paste it to its own line, and then close it. But then I'm going to add, I'm going to go deeper into this into this path, um, specifically to, to target the state when I'm hovering over the item. Um, so we have here colon hover. There's no space here. These languages are often very, very, very consistent, but then there's a couple of little outliers, and this is one of them. And if I want to target when you hover over your A tag, there's a no space there. If you put a space, it won't work. But we're saying whenever someone hovers on this link, in this list item, in that bullet point list, do the following. And um, I think what we'll do is say uh, box dot box dash shadow. Um, let's do five pixel, five pixel, five pixel black. That should make a little drop shadow when you hover over your buttons. That's cool, and then you can affect it in different ways. Maybe maybe play with these. If I never explained what these did, hopefully you think, well, what happens if I put a 1 there or a 12 there? Hopefully you kind of play with some of these things. But what's happening is that um, I'm making a shadow that will appear 5 pixels to the right, 5 pixels down, 5 pixels blurry, and then a color. So if I want it to look just a little bit hovering, you know, one pixel, two pixel. If I want it to look very blurry, and, uh, seven pixels. The result there is something like that. Uh, okay, what about really moved over? We'll say 11, 11, 7. When I hover, it looks like it's really jumping off of the page. And because it's digital, you know, a shadow in the real world, these shadows that I'm seeing on the table right here, they're black or gray or whatever. But in the digital world, I'm not, I'm not used, I'm not limited to just black shadow. I can do red or any sort of color. 
Now, these are positive values. I can set them to negative. If I set the first value to negative, instead of moving the shadow to the right, it moves it to the left. Because you, you start from the top left corner of the item, and then you move over 11. Or negative 11 goes negative 11 to the left. This second value, negative there, it goes in the vertical. So we have x and y and blur and color, negative values to the x to the left. This one's counterintuitive. Usually when you go up, the numbers go higher, but not here because it starts from the top left corner of the item. So positive values are down. Um, on 11. Negative values are up. It goes up there. Now, what's between positive and negative? Zero. So what happens if you put zero? zero. It'll make a shadow in the origin, which is kind of like a, just kind of a little glow around it. So it doesn't actually move it left or right, up or down. It's right behind the object. Seven pixels of blur, red. If I put less values of blur, like 2, you see it a little less, like really, really tiny. And bigger values, bigger blur values. So in the old days, um, I've been, uh, I, forget, I don't remember if I said it at the beginning of the day, I've I used to be a student here, yes, but I've been teaching at Southwestern College since 2007. So I've taught these variety of classes for a long time, and I've seen it evolve. And I remember in the old days, you know, 10 years ago or more, to do that was very hard. You had to use JavaScript. JavaScript was, was, into, it was in play to do these, these changes. And what you had to do was, in Photoshop, you had to create a version of your graphic plane. Oh, and then create a version of it blurry, and then write the JavaScript to switch the two, and then you mess up your code and it doesn't work. Well, now right here, yes, it's still some amount of code, but it doesn't require separate graphics. It's these two lines of code here. What, is the, what does the link look like before you hover? What does the link look like when you hover? And then you just you know write your particular values and such. Get these cool results. Obviously, this is still a while away from something like, you know, the college's website. Anticlimactic. Okay, there it is. Uh, this is obviously a while away from the college's website. This is all still HTML. I can still go behind the scenes and look at their code. But all of this is still HTML, and like when I hover over this, okay, it animates it and moves over. You can do some of that still in CSS. You can write some CSS code to make that pop out. You have that animation there. So all of this like really modern website. Look at this this box here. Instead of it being um, you know horizontal vertical, there's this cool like line across it diagonally. All of this design of a modern website, you can still. Uh, program it all by hand like this. It's more complex, but it's still all of this code. Ours is this at the moment, but if you've never had any experience before, this is still pretty far. Uh, I'll check you one moment. So if you get it up to this point right here, you've come pretty far if you've never had any of this experience. If you had have, have had some of this coding experience, a little refresher once in a while is, is okay, and hopefully you learn maybe one or two things. But um, this is kind of as far as I want to go for the moment. This is all coming from this optional book, page 325. We're creating a version of it. Now, the book also has like a graphic that really ties it all together. We don't have a graphic, but that would be part of the homework where you're going to download a graphic and put it into your folder because this folder that I'm working on right here on the desktop you know it's missing the image I wrote code that says there is an image called my image there is an image called image 2 or whatever it's called in this folder it's not there therefore the link is broken so is 
long as you put it in that same um, folder, then, the web, then it'll find it. Yep, the easiest way to do this is as long as the image is in the folder, the code will find it. Now you can get fancy and put there a link to your image. If I have an image on a website, for example, http victor.com slash images slash jpeg, you know, if I have a full path to an image on the internet, that'll work as well. I don't have an image on the internet there, so it's still broken. But yeah, easy answer is as long as you've got that image in that folder, the code will find it. So this code that we worked on together will be your basis for the first homework assignment. We're going to have uh, lab time in a moment from 3.30 to 4 to confirm that it works. Everything that I've been writing or doing here um, has, is being recorded. And remember, I'm adding this. I'm uploading this so you can replay it if it didn't quite work for you. We'll do lab time in a moment. Um, before that, looking at the uh, canvas, if you'd like to look at it as well, on Canvas, the assignment that I'm talking about, so in modules, week one, the HTML assignment, 10 points due on Monday. Um, this is the example we just did together. Okay, so a little bit of preamble. It, what you need to do is to create a folder with your last name, week one, you need to create an HTML document called index. You might already have that. Using any code editor, you're going to write a basic site like the example, which is what we started to do here together. You must add the following. I need to see a graphic at the top, whatever graphic you want. I need to see a center graphic down at the bottom over here, whatever you want. Um, five navbar links. They don't have to really link to anything. The idea is, right now we created something called company logo. It's so generic. Repairs for sale. I don't know what that is. You want to make your own very, very basic homepage of a website about whatever you want. Maybe a hobby of yours. Maybe, you know, what, what are you into? Maybe a real website, whatever. So if you're making a website about your hobby, you're going to find a photo that represents it up here and another one here and change these to say, you know, home, uh, collecting tips, hot prices, you know, whatever. You're going to make your own links about what those nav bar items are based on your idea. Write something in that text box. We wrote gibberish. You need to write something meaningful. Background color. You probably are tired of the colors that we were working with in class. This weird mustard color, I'm tired of it. You want to find a better color. And what I would say about that, I, I think I'll put it in the notes somewhere. If you go over to W3 Schools, there is a reference of colors. You can go look up all of the colors that are, that are possible, plus a little color mixer. If you, if you want a certain shade of red, you can mix it and it'll give you the code. So color reference, you have these basic ones, and there's a color mixer over here somewhere. And um, yep, you can mix your own colors. So, what else? Um, page border. So, this border that we started to make together, um, you want to complete it. You're going to upload this to Canvas, and the easiest way is to zip the whole thing together. If you're on Windows, you can, uh, you can go to your folder, right-click, and then send to zip folder. On Mac, I believe you can also right click or command click. And there's an item there, compress folder. Um, if you put it all together as one zipped file, that's often easier to turn in because then it's one file you're turning in, not the folder, but the zipped file. Or else when you, when you try to turn it in, uh, you know, pressing the submit button over here, you'll have to upload every piece. You'll have to upload the index file, the two images, etc. It, it won't upload a folder. It won't know what to do with it. So you want to zip it and then upload the whole thing. Then we've got extra credit. Create pages for each of those other nav bars. Right now, if I click on contact, nothing happens. If you make a page, 
with something here, not just an empty screen, you can get some extra credit points. Question. Um, do we have to make them like about those, or can we just like edit those and then just make? The starting point that we did together is a very good place to get started with, and then add more or change it. So yeah, you can take this what it is right now and change it up so that it's what you care about. You don't have to start from scratch, but if you do, you get practice. More practice. Yeah, that makes sense. And so the extra credit is uh, is that each of those pages. Now, uh, in the real world, the way I would do this is if I if I design if I design my home page pretty complete, I can just make copies of this home page and call it about or whatever. And now that page, now that copy of that file is an exact copy of the original, and I just need to just go in and change the details. Nice. So that's the extra credit part. If you complete those links, you can get up to five more points extra credit. Um, right here, five more points. You'll be graded on your ability to code this basic HTML CSS file. Um, it's worth 10 points due Monday the 17th by midnight basically so you still have the whole day Monday it looks something like that hey that's what we did we put a horizontal lines here and then the links they put a graphic there of their logo and they put a graphic here it's one graphic with three looks like a pretty good piano yeah uh, they are the specialists and then some text that's what we did although ours is missing the graphics that's why I might look a little incomplete they've got the border also Double border. And then when I when you upload your work and I grade it, I'm just going to go through this. Did you do your HTML files on a scale of 0 to 2? So if you have it, 2 points. Did you do the HTML layout that I'm asking you here like we did together? Up to 4 points. You do the CSS colors and stuff? Up to 4 points. 10 in total. Maybe you missed something? Okay, 3 out of 4 points. You get 9 out of 10. That's still an A. It's the, the basic, you know, 10 points, perfect A. 9 points A, 8 points B, 7 points C, and below 7 points, do it again. So this is what's due on Monday. We'll have a little lab time until 4 in case it didn't quite work. Any general questions? Yeah. What if you don't have like a domain? You don't have to do this on a domain, actually. All that we did right now, we did it on the desktop. So you don't need it on a website anywhere yet. You can just work right off of your desktop. What you do need is the code editor, and we use brackets, right? So you can go to the web and look up download brackets, and then download brackets and start using it, or use the one from uh, you know, Visual Code. Um, and so you, you don't need a domain. You just need a code editor, and you just need to save your files somewhere, like on your desktop or flash drive. And that's all you need at the moment.